Okay, John, we are live. Okay. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, my name is John Paul May. I'm technical director at Hopsteiner. Uh, I've been working in the hop industry uh, since 1993. So I've had quite a few years working in hops. Um, a few years ago, uh, my research group uh, did a pretty big deep dive on the impact of dry hopping when it, how it can affect bitterness, the IBU test, uh, pH and beer foam. And so uh, when we started hearing about this new style of beer, the New England IPA or these hazy IPAs, we started to wonder, are these beers really any different from your typical West Coast style IPA? So um, what we did is uh, we contacted a bunch of breweries in New England that make these West Coast or these New England IPAs and we told them we wanted to do this deep dive analysis. We also were wondering if maybe the haze had any special properties. And so anyways, uh, we were fortunate enough to get 12 brewers to send us beer. Uh, we asked them that they send it very fresh. And <clears throat> when we got it, uh, we ran through a bunch of tests. So uh, next slide. So what I'm gonna cover in this presentation it's so going to talk briefly on how to brew a New England style IPA. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we got 12 uh, different beers and we analyzed them with high performance liquid chromatography to look at various hop compounds. And then what we did is we compared uh, the results of the New England IPA to the database we have for West Coast style IPAs. We also did a lot of testing of the haze itself. Uh, we did turbidity testing, yeast counts. Uh, we looked at the hop acid contribution to haze. We did some centrifuging tests. Uh, we did some analysis on the haze itself. And uh, <clears throat> we also did uh, haze stability uh, testing. And then the other uh, two tests we did is uh, we did the IBUs uh, on these beers as well as we measured the foam. Okay, next slide. So, when it comes to brewing a New England IPA, some people believe uh, water treatment is important. Um, some people will uh, treat their brewing water with 150 to 200 ppm of chloride. They feel that helps with the mouthfeel and the softness. And then they use about half that dose rate in terms of sulfate addition. And again, uh, they think that might help, help the uh, hop character of the, of the beer. Uh, the grain bill in some cases is, can be uh, similar to like a German wheat beer. Uh, they use about 10 to 50 percent of high protein adjuncts like uh, flaked oats or wheat. Uh, wheat's a good one to use uh, because uh, of the 13 percent protein that's in wheat, 80 percent is prolamins. Uh, prolamins are proline rich uh, pro proteins and they're very haze active. And what they'll essentially do is they will hydrogen bond with polyphenols to form haze. So. A lot of people who brew uh, these New England style IPAs like to use some wheat in there. Uh, the hop varieties are uh, important. Um, again, people like to use uh, fruit forward or citrusy varieties. Um, they usually use more than three pounds per barrel. And uh, some of the varieties they look for are ones that are very high in geraniol. Geraniol is uh, a, uh, uh, the hop varieties that are high in geraniol are like Bravo, uh, Hop Center's experimental 09326, uh, Sultana, uh, Cascade, and uh, Centennial, just to name a few. Uh, the yeast strain is also important. Um, people like to use a medium to low attenuating yeast, uh, a medium low flocculating yeast. High ester strains like London Ale 3, uh, Dry English Ale, Conan, and S33 are, are often used uh, for these uh, brewing these beers. Uh, next slide. How to use the hops is really important when it comes to brewing New England uh, style IPAs. Uh, little to no hops are added to the brew kettle and uh, usually as much as 30 to 50% of the hops are added to the Whirlpool. A lot of craft brewers like to lower the temperature of the Whirlpool if they can before they add the hops. That does two things. One, it minimizes the boiling off of the hop oils, the hop essential oils. It also minimizes the isomerization of alpha acids into isoalpha acids. Uh, during the dry hopping period, the hops are generally added during uh, active primary fermentation. 
and multiple hop dosages are generally uh, recommended. So usually about 24 hours to 48 hours after you pitch your yeast, uh, brewers will start adding about one pound of hops per barrel per day for usually three days, if not more. And again, the reason they do this is they're trying to take advantage of this biotransformation. So it's, I don't know if you could see here, but the, this geraniol can be uh, converted into beta citronellol or into linalool, and then they can also be esterified to make esters. So uh, it's really important to have uh, hop essential oils going through fermentation to enable to produce these uh, juicy, fruity flavors. Again, these are high gravity beers, they're big beers. So we're looking at alcohol concentrations of about 6.3 to seven and a half. The IBUs are pretty high also, 50 to 70. We actually measured 41 to 108 and you'll see that. And uh, the color again is about uh, four to seven SRMs. Next slide. So uh, the hop compounds that we tested for uh, using uh, high performance liquid chromatography are the bitter hop compounds like isoalpha acids, humulinones, and alpha acids. We also looked at the non-bitter compounds like beta acids, myrcene, and uh, xanthohumol. Uh, xanthohumol, for those who don't know, it's a unique polyphenol found in hops. Uh, it's a very, very good hydroxy radical scavenger. And the more you can have in your beer, the better. Uh, these um, uh, xanthohumol is really good at enhancing uh, the shelf life of beers. Uh, for those who don't know, humulinones, okay, they're derived from alpha acids that have been oxidized, okay, and the concentration in hops is usually fairly low, maybe 0.25 to 0.3 percent, uh, and because humulinones have this hydroxy group relative to isoalpha acids, which has this just this hydrogen group, this hydroxy group makes humulinones very, very soluble. And in fact, it also makes the humulinone actually have a more smooth bitterness. It doesn't linger on the tongue as long as like isoalpha acid. So uh, humulinones are, are known to have a very smooth bitterness. And again, they're about 66% uh, or two thirds as bitter as isoalpha acids. Uh, alpha acids are reported to be about one tenth as bitter as isoalpha acids. And so, uh, so the way we measure these compounds, again, <clears throat> using HPLC, uh, what we do is, um, well, we, next slide, please. Yeah. So how the HPLC operates is uh, we have a solvent, which people call a mobile phase. Uh, it goes through a high pressure pump. We have an injection point. And I kid you not, we just literally inject a very tiny quantity of beer into this injection point. And the mobile phase will push that beer sample through a special HPLC column, which has special packing packing material, and that packing material allows uh, the separation of the various hop compounds based on their polarity. Eventually, it leaves the uh, column and it goes through a UV detector, and then you get a bunch of peaks. And uh, this is a picture of what a typical HPLC uh, looks like. Okay, next slide. So we do a lot of uh, HPLC analysis on hop products as well as uh, beer. And uh, as I mentioned a few years ago, when we were looking at uh, regular, uh, you know, West Coast style IPAs, we, we noticed when we were measuring them by HPLC, we see a lot of humulinones in the beer, a lot of isoalpha acids, as well as a lot of alpha acids. Okay, next slide. So uh, of the 12 beers uh, that we received, this is uh, what we saw in terms of the isoalpha acid concentration. Uh, the range was as low as 5 ppm all the way up to 32 ppm, with the average being about 20 ppm. Again, this is versus uh, what we see in a typical West Coast style IPA, where the average was about 48 ppm. So the ISO concentration is uh, quite a bit lower in these New England IPAs versus uh, West Coast style IPAs. Next slide. Uh, we also measured the humulinone concentration in these beers. Uh, and again, the range was 12 ppm all the way up to 38, with the average being 26. This is versus uh, 11 ppm for the West Coast style IPAs. So we got quite a bit more humulinone in the beer than in West Coast style IPAs. Okay, next slide. 
What we did here is we just looked at the ratio of humulinones to isoalpha acids uh, versus bitterness. So to give you an idea, the, uh, the humulinone uh, to isoalpha acid ratio was 1.3. And so what that really tells us is that about half of the bitterness comes from humulinones. So as I mentioned, humulinones have that nice, smooth, non-lingering bitterness. This is why a lot of these uh, hazy IPAs have a nice, smooth, non-lingering bitterness. It's due to these very high concentrations of humulinones uh, in the beer. Next slide. Again, we measured the alpha acid concentration and the alpha concentration in these beers was really, really quite high. Uh, we saw a range of a low of 17 ppm all the way up to 72, with the average being 31. Again, this is versus 13 ppm for West Coast style IPA. Next slide. This was perhaps the most uh, shocking and unexpected result uh, was seeing beta acids uh, in these uh, New England IPAs. Just so you know, beta acids are extremely nonpolar, all right? They're not soluble in beer. You, ju you just don't see them in beer. And to see concentrations of 1 to 14, uh, with the average being about 5, was uh, really uh, unexpected. Uh, and so we knew something was going on here, and uh, it led us to doing some more, more testing. Uh, next slide. Uh, the mercine concentration, again, was uh, elevated uh, compared to West Coast style IPAs with the range being a half a ppm all the way up to two and a half with the average being 1.4. Again, uh, mercine is very nonpolar. Uh, you don't expect to see a lot in beer, but in these beers we did. Uh, again, versus a West Coast style IPA where usually we see less than 0.3 ppm. Next slide. Again, xanthahumol is that great polyphenol you want in your beer. Uh, and these beers, actually, the concentrations were relatively high. Uh, we saw a low of 0.9 all the way up to 3.5 ppm, with the average being 2. Uh, this is versus a West Coast style IPA, which we see about 0.7 ppm. So when I saw this result, I thought to myself, you know, these beers should have incredibly good shelf life. Yet uh, these hazy IPAs or New England IPAs are notorious for having very poor shelf life. And so that got me thinking, a lot of these uh, hazy IPAs, they're packaged in cans. And if you're going uh, to have your beer packaged in cans and you're using uh, like a mobile package unit, that's probably why the shelf life of those beers are really poor. A lot of those mobile packagers, they really have poor uh, low oxygen uh, uh, love, you know, you have very high oxygen levels in, in your packaged beer. I mean, you can have as much as 200 parts per billion dissolved oxygen, whereas, you know, a state of the art, you know, packaging line is generally under 50 parts per billion. So you might want to check that if you have a really poor shelf life, you might want to look at getting a better, better packaging uh, uh, for your for your material, because these beers should have actually very good shelf life. Uh, next slide. Uh, we looked at the uh, change in uh, some of these hop compounds over time. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we really don't lose too much isoalpha acids over three months. Um, uh, the humulone concentration actually went up a little bit, and that's probably because uh, we lost a little bit of the alpha acids in the beer. As you can see here, we started off with about 21.6, and it drops to 17.9. Uh, and we know alpha acids, if they oxidize, they can get converted into uh, humulone, so that's probably what's happening there. Uh, we lose a little bit of beta acids, and uh, the xanthahumol seems to change slightly. Uh, okay, next slide. Yeah, so <clears throat> we wanted to measure the haze of the spear, so uh, we did some turbidity uh, testing on the 12 beers that we got. So uh, let's see what those results look like. Next slide. So as you can see, the turbidity on these beers was uh, uh, at quite a range. Uh, as low as 119 NTUs, all the way up to 1700 NTUs, with the average being about 547. Again, usually West Coast style IPAs, uh, the haze isn't very high, it's only about 30 NTUs. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so one of our thoughts initially was that, uh, you know, maybe this haze is due to yeast, 
you know, uh, there's a lot of yeast and wheat beers. So we thought maybe this was the case here. And so uh, what we did is uh, we did yeast counts and kind of as a rule of thumb is uh, for a yeast count of 1 million cells per mil, uh, that'll usually contribute an NTU of uh, eight and a half. And so um, uh, when we did the yeast counts on these beers, only one beer had a, a yeast count of uh, over a, a million yeast cells. And that was uh, beer J. All the others uh, were very, very low. And so yeast was not generally a contributor to haze, except for this one, one beer that had fairly high yeast counts. Next slide. Yeah, so what we wanted to do here is look at the effect of hop compounds on haze. So we took a controlled beer and we added three ppm of xanthohumol. And as you can see here, xanthohumol doesn't contribute haze. Uh, we added uh, 34 ppm of alpha acids, which is a pretty high level. Uh, and it only contributed about 10 uh, NTU, so not, not too much. Beta acids are actually known to uh, contribute haze. So as you can see here, just 12 ppm uh, contributed about 30 NTUs. So when we combined the, uh, you know, all these three samples of xanthohumol, alpha, and beta, you know, we did get some NTUs pretty high, about 70. So just the hop acids in themselves could contribute as much as 10% of the turbidity uh, in these uh, hazy IPAs. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so what we did here is we were wondering if the haze uh, was acting kind of maybe as a carrier and solubilizing, you know, these non polar hop compounds. So what we did is we plotted the haze uh, versus the concentration of myrcene, xanthohumol, and beta acids. And essentially what we found was that was indeed the case. Um, as the beers became more hazy, uh, the haze was able to solubilize these nonpolar compounds and actually increase their concentration with increasing haze. So that was uh, kind of interesting. Next slide. Yeah, so to see if we can prove that the haze is indeed acting as a carrier, uh, we did some centrifuging testing. So as you can see uh, here on the left column, uh, one H is the hazy beer and one C is the uh, centrifuge beer. And the same thing, uh, we have a two H for the hazy beer and two C for the centrifuge beer. And as you can see, when we uh, centrifuge the beer one, uh, you know, we lose about two thirds of the haze and the uh, centrifuge beer two, we lose uh, about half the haze. And so if we look at the change in the uh, humulinone concentration from the hazy beer to the centrifuge beer, uh, we see there's really not very much of a change. And again, this kind of goes to show that the humulones are very uh, soluble in beer and the haze really isn't helping it to become even more soluble. It doesn't need the haze. Uh, the same is true with the uh, isoalpha acids. You know, uh, The iso concentration on these beers really doesn't change too much when we centrifuge the beer. However, alpha acids are fairly nonpolar. And so as you can see in the first beer, we lose about half uh, the alpha acids. And in the second beer, we lose um, perhaps about a third or 40%. Um, we lose a little more than half of the myrcene. Uh, again, myrcene is very nonpolar and about half in the, uh, in the second beer. Um, in xanthohumol, we, we lose quite a bit uh, in the centri by centrifuging. And again, beta acids are very nonpolar, so uh, we lose a lot of uh, beta when we uh, centrifuge the, the beers. Okay, next slide. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what we did in this case is uh, we isolated the precipitate uh, from several uh, beers, and then we freeze dried them to remove the moisture. And then we sent it out to an outside lab for protein analysis. And what we found is that the uh, freeze-dried powder, uh, uh, you know, precipitate uh, contained about 35% uh, protein, which shouldn't be expected. Again, we know these beers, uh, a lot of the haze is coming from uh, the uh, prolamines, the, these proline-rich uh, proteins. And again, as unexpected, we tested for polyphenols and we measured 3.4% polyphenols in the beer. Um, we also did some fatty acid analysis and we found 9% or 0.9% fatty acids. And of that 0.9%, uh, 0.22 was uh, linolenic acid, uh, 0.52 was linoleic acid, and then 0.19% uh, was oleic acid. And we also measured about 10% starch. Uh, when it came to the hop compounds, again, just a tiny amount of myrcene, 8% uh, 
alpha acids, uh, 3% beta, and then very small quantities of uh, xanthohumol, uh, uh, isoalpha acids, and uh, humulinones. So, so as we stated before, um, uh, the haze is most likely and is primarily this proline uh, polyphenol complex, but also with a, a fair amount of hop acids uh, tied up in that mixture, in that matrix. Okay, next slide. Yeah, hay stability is always an issue with these uh, beers. And again, that's primarily because as the uh, prolamins start to hydrogen bond with uh, the polyphenols in the beer, the molecule, the haze molecule gets just bigger and bigger and bigger over time until eventually it becomes insoluble and, and starts to crash out. So a lot of these beers, uh, you know, lose the majority of their haze uh, over time. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, brewers do over in Germany, you know, for their wheat beers is they, they ship their beers uh, upside down, you know, so that way when the kegs are turned around, you know, they flip around. So you could probably do something like that even with your cans of beer, you know, probably package them upside down. And then when the customer opens up the box, he flips them up upright. So that way they get kind of mixed up, mixed in a little bit. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so we did uh, the IBU tests on these beers. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, back in uh, 1955, when Rigby and Bethune published their research showing that indeed it was alpha acids that thermally isomerized during the boil to form a new hop acid, isoalpha acids, and that it's actually the isoalpha acids that's responsible for the bitterness in beer. It didn't take too long for some analytical chemists to develop a uh, very simple test method for measuring isoalpha acids in beer. And that's the uh, IBU test method. And essentially what they kind of came up with is for every PPM of isoalpha acids in the beer, you'll get a IBU measurement of about one IBUs. And this test method is actually uh, quite accurate uh, if you're adding hops solely in the brew kettle. And it works very well for uh, beers that are about five to 35 uh, IBUs. Once you go a little lower than that and go a little above that, then it starts to skew. But it's a very simple uh, liquid, liquid, liquid extraction test method where you take uh, 10 milliliters of beer, uh, 20 milliliters of isooctane, uh, you add one drop of octanol, which is a defomer, and then you add one mil of 30, 30, three normal uh, HCl. You add it all to a 50 milliliter uh, centrifuge tube, and then you shake it for 15 minutes and then allow uh, the uh, layers to separate. You isolate the uh, upper acidic isooctane layer. You put it in a cuvette. You put it into your UV spectrometer. You measure the absorbance at 275 nanometers. You multiply it by 50 and voila, it tells you how many parts per million of isoalpha acid you have in your beer. However, there's one problem. When you dry hop beers, as we've just shown, your dry hop beer not in addition to containing isoalpha acids, it also contains humulinones, alpha acids, and in the case for New England IPAs, beta acids, as well as xanthohumol, as well as perhaps some other hop compounds. Anyways, these compounds do get extracted into the isooctane layer and they do absorb at 275 nanometers. Next slide. So what we did here is we made 30 ppm solutions of isoalpha acid and isooctane, humulinones and isooctane, alpha acids and isooctane, and xanthohumol and isooctane. And then because we knew the concentration, we ran their UV spec, and then we were able to measure the absorbance, okay? And so what we're, once we know the concentration and the absorbance, we can determine the response factor. So we measured a response factor for isoalpha acids as 0.7. And that's good because that's what's reported in the literature. Okay, humulones and alpha acids both had a response factor of 0.6. So that means they absorb about 85% as much as isoalpha acids. However, humulones are only two thirds as bitter as isoalpha acids and alpha acids are one tenth as bitter as isoalpha acids. And beta acids are about 0.4% or 0.4, it has a response factor of 0.4. And it's non-bitter, but still, again, you're getting about 
a little over half of the response as ISO. And so it's adding to the IBUs, but not adding to any of the bitterness. And as you can see here, xanthohumol has a very, very small response factor relative to ice wall acids, it's 0 0.07. So it's not really contributing uh, to the uh, IBUs, but the other three uh, hop compounds are absolutely do. Next slide. So um, what we did here, so this was the range in the IBUs, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, uh, the IBUs uh, range from 41 to 108 with the average being 63. Now, because we also did HPLC analysis on these beers, what we did is we developed a very simple uh, formula, which you can see at the bottom of this slide, which we just call calculated bitterness, okay? And so what we do is we add up all the bitterness uh, relative to iso alpha acids. So again, we, we take the concentration of iso and PPM and we, add it to the concentration of humulinones, but we multiply humulinones by 0.66 because it's two thirds as bitter as ice alpha acids. And then we add the concentration of alpha acids, but we multiply the alpha by 0.1 because we know it's one tenth as bitter as ice alpha acids. And so when we add all of this up, what we get is a calculated bitterness number, which is more similar to the sensory bitterness of your beer. And so if you look at the uh, average IBU, we have 63. And if you look at the average calculated bitterness, it's 37. What this kind of tells us is that the, the calculated bitterness or the sensory bitterness of this beer is perhaps a little bit more than half of what the IBU test result would suggest. And this is what a lot of craft brewers are seeing. They are seeing these you know, ridiculously high IBU numbers, but when they taste the beer, it doesn't taste anything like what the IBU number would suggest. And that's because of uh, the artificial inflating of this IBU by these low uh, bitter hop compounds present in, in, the, uh, in the beer. Okay, next slide. So the reason the IBU test does not work for dry hop beers is because isoalpha acids, humulinones, alpha acids, and beta acids in dry hop beers get extracted into the isooctane layer and absorb light at 275 nanometers. And because they absorb at different intensities, you cannot uh, correlate the IBU to e not even total hop acid concentration or sensory bitterness. The best way to estimate the sensory bitterness of your beer is by uh, calculating its bitterness. And if you have an HPLC, you can do that very, very accurately and very, very easily. Okay, next slide. As I mentioned, the other test we performed on these beers uh, was uh, a foam stability testing. And in the brewing industry, the Nibom foam stability tester is considered the industry standard. The primary reason is it's very reproducible and that's why brewers like to use it. The way it works is you can take a bottle of beer or a can of beer and this machine will transfer that beer into a beaker and then this machine has a flasher, which causes the beer to foam. And then uh, the, as the foam is collapsing, it measures the collapse over 30 millimeters and reports uh, the results in seconds. Next foam. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as you can see here, um, <clears throat> uh, I have, uh, we, we measured the foam of this beer at two different temperatures. One of the things I really don't like about the Nibom foam stability tester, it recommends you test the beer at room temperature. The problem with doing that is you generally always get a much lower result, plus beer is consumed cold. So because we have some nice warehouses for storing hops, we're able to move all the equipment into a warehouse and do the testing at cold temperatures. So as you can see here, we're getting like some very, very high numbers. Anything over 200 generally is good, but you know, 400 or, or more is, you know, just fantastic. And so uh, again, uh, these uh, New England IPAs have in most cases, very, very good foam. Next slide. All right, so uh, in conclusion, the smooth bitterness that many people experience drinking New England IPAs is due to the high humulinone concentration in these beers and the relatively low concentration of isoalpha acids. 
Like West Coast style IPAs, the sensory bitterness of New England IPAs is a little bit more than half of what the IBU test result would indicate. And again, this is due to the fact that in addition to isoalpha acids, humulinones, alpha acids, and beta acids get extracted into the isooctane layer and absorb and interfere with the IBU test results. And they're only two thirds, one tenth, and one twentieth as bitter as isoalpha acids. The foam quality of New England IPAs are generally very good. And again, this is due to the high protein content in the beers and the high alpha acid concentrations in the beers. I didn't mention this earlier, but alpha acids added to beer post-fermentation are generally very good at enhancing foam. Uh, the haze stability of New England IPAs isn't very good, uh, with most beers dropping to less than 400 NTUs within the first uh, couple of months after packaging. Next slide. Analysis of the haze shows that 36% of the haze is protein, 3% is polyphenols, 0.9% fatty acids, about 10% is hydrocarbates uh, or starch, and 12% is hop compounds. The use of high protein adjuncts rich in prolamines like wheat are known to combine with polyphenols to form haze. Hop acids can also contribute to haze, but it's small. And due to the very low yeast counts in most of these beers, yeast is generally not a contributor to haze, but it can be at higher concentrations. And the big secret here is that the haze in the New England IPA can act as a carrier and increase the solubility and concentration of nonpolar hop compounds like alpha acids, xanthohumol, beta acids, and other nonpolar aroma compounds and most likely other nonpolar flavor compounds, which contribute to this unique flavor and style of this beer. Next slide. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank you for your kind attention. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, Bob Smith, who did all the testing and analysis for this work. And I'd like to thank our uh, New England breweries for supplying the beers. Uh, without their beer uh, donations, uh, we wouldn't have been able to get this work done. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. Um, not seeing any questions in the chat. This is Matt with the Montana Brewers Association, by the way. Um, but if anybody has any questions, you can just type, uh, I have a question, we'll bring you on live and you can just ask your question verbally. Quiet group this morning. We'll give folks a little, a few minutes here. Um, All right. There was a session yesterday, and it did last call for questions. And right when we, when we said it was over, I saw some questions pop up, but it was too late. Yeah, people could be typing away right now. Well, I've got my email address there as well. If uh, people want to just shoot me an email, that would be fine as well. Well, thank you so much, John. Great presentation. I, this is all very interesting. Um, and um, as John said, he's shared his email there. If anybody has any follow-up questions, feel free to get in touch with him. All righty, going once, twice. <laughs> Seeing no questions, I guess this is uh, a wrap. Thanks again, John. Really appreciate you joining us and, and being part of our conference. Great. You're welcome, Matt. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Okay.